Father, we want to thank you. Thank you that you're a God who loves us. Thank you that you're a God who cares. And sometimes we question that. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we question why you allow us to go through different things or experience things or health things or finance things or relationship things. And sometimes we start to question, do you really love us? And yet, Lord, even as we celebrated communion last night, it's just a reminder, you gave everything for us. You gave your life for us. What more love do we need you to show? Um, what more proof do we need? And so, Father, we just want to say thank you that you care about us. Thank you that you're here today. We want to meet with you. We want to celebrate you. And so thank you for the gift of today that we can be here together. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you want a really um, meaningful worship experience, you have to sit in the front row. The reason for that is when you're sitting in the back row or near the back, you don't hear all the voices behind you. But when you're sitting in the front and all the voices are projecting this way, it sounds like a choir. I've sat in the back row. I know what it's like. You're missing it. So next week, we should have a big fight for who's going to be sitting in the front row because that's where it's the most powerful worship experience. And I encourage you to test it out and see what it's like. It's actually not that scary being in the front row, except for when I'm speaking. But, you know, it's, yeah, enjoy it. Today we actually have a guest speaker, Scott Campbell. He's not really a, um, a visitor to LifeBridge. He's been here, he's just told me, 18 times. We got talking to him about his scattered attendance. But, um, but Scott is our, uh, for our denomination, he's sort of the, the field supervisor for Eastern Canada. And by Eastern Canada, I mean Toronto, Montreal, and us here in Nova Scotia. And, uh, and he pops down a couple of times a year just to connect with us. And he, he's actually going to speak today just because it worked out that for him to be able to do so. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, this is the last official Sunday that Gordon and Anna are here at LifeBridge before they head off to Honduras. And so um, we just, I, we've already given them our formal farewell a couple of times. <laughs> but this is our last official informal farewell. And, um, and, because, and for those of you who don't know, Gordon and Anna, are, we're sending them as missionaries from LifeBridge down to Honduras, where we already have some partnerships, uh, both with uh, Compassion International, uh, with our children's sponsorships. And by the way, we're going to be making some more children available in November. And we also partner with Mandos Extendidas, Extended Hands Ministry down there. And so Gordon and Anne are going down there to, be in, to, to just equip and, and develop um, leaders. It, it's a, a discipling, equipping ministry to raise up leaders who can care for the people of Honduras. And, and that support is definitely needed. And, uh, and also, they'll be on the grounds for LifeBridge helping uh, coordinate stuff for us. But not just for us, but other churches that are starting to partner with them all across Canada now. And that's, that's really exciting. And so um, I'm going to invite uh, Gordon to come on up. And, and he's got a song that he wants to share, share with you today. And then I'm going to invite, uh, after the song, I'm going to invite Scott as sort of our BGC representative uh, to come up and, and pray for Gordon and Anna as well. That's a sign right there. I think Jonathan cemented that mic in there for a reason. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, wow. You're a good-looking crew this morning. Grandma? <laughs> Grandpa, where is he? <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Fellow Grandpa. It's just been, uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird day. It's a good day, but it's a weird day for us. And uh, we've been... Th it's a day that I guess part of me always believed would come, but also doubted. You ever been there? You know, I believe, but sometimes I doubt. Deep down, I really believe, but I have my doubts and I have my fears. And I've been thinking a lot about, about the cost. Uh, so let, I'll let Jesus uh, speak to you. And he's talking about the cost of being a disciple. And he said, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. 
And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Don't begin until you count the cost. And to be honest, uh, I believe that we did that in the beginning. I'm not sure that I did as good a job as I thought I was doing in the beginning. <laughs> but count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and everyone would laugh at you, and they would say, there's a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. And we could not have afforded to finish this without you. It would have been impossible. There's no way it would ever have happened. And I don't think God wanted it to happen, and we didn't either. And Jesus says, so you cannot become a disciple without giving up everything you own. And Peter said to him, and a, a little while later, he said, but Peter said to him, we've left everything, our homes, all we had to follow you. And if you were in our house this week or next week, you will discover that pretty much everything is gone or going. And truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children or grandchildren or church family Or friends, or four legged best friends, all your greatest treasures for the sake of the kingdom of God. No one who does that will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come. Well, it's obviously a privilege to be here with you. I, it was kind of unexpected, but 28 years ago, Nancy and I left. We did what you're doing, and it's a big step, but it's a really good step. And God has great things for you down there, great people and new family. And uh, So it's normal that there's sadness to leave this group. You're, I mean, it's not as though you'll never be seen again. Probably. At least we hope not. <laughs> but uh, I, I consider it a privilege to pray for you. So, Lord Jesus, you're the one that called us to follow you. You're the one that called your disciples. You said, as you go out into this world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Holy Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And you also promised us, I'm with you till the end of the world. And so that's what we pray for Gordon and Anna. We pray that a sense would be a powerful sense, would be you're with them, you're accompanying them, they're not alone, they're not forsaken. Thank you for the group down there that will receive them. There's already a family down there of believers who are looking forward to their coming. Lord, I ask for patience as they live culture shock. I ask for a special touch from you that even as they are wondering, will they ever, ever learn enough Spanish to share you with another believer or even especially with a non-believer? I pray again for patience and trust. Lord, most of all, fill them with your spirit and presence so that just their lives, their actions, their style of living would be a light for you. Just their very presence would communicate that you are alive. You came from afar. You incarnated yourself in this world. May they, as they come from afar, incarnate themselves in Honduras and live out your presence. So put your hand on them. May they go forth, yes, with some sadness, but at the same time with joy and anticipation. And thank you that they're going not only to give, but they will receive. 
they will grow and change and be transformed as much as the people down there. So Lord, help them to see that. Help them to be humble and receive, especially in these early days when they have so much to learn. We ask this in your name. Amen. Oh, okay. Yeah, stand would be great. In the church that I'm a part of, they, maybe I better not say this, they play along with the band. <laughs> Everyone has instruments and they, uh, let's see, I guess I can be here. Uh, is it okay if I just peel the, this off? Anyway, good morning. It is, it's great to be with you, see faces, people I know. And as Rob says, I, I do have to confess that my uh, attendance has been sporadic. 18 times in nine years. 10 years this, uh, this spring. So maybe I can get down one more time before. Um, a word to the men, just quickly. Uh, it struck me as Rob spoke and said that often we don't have the, those deep relationships and we are lone rangers. And immediately I thought, but even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. So guys, we have no excuse. <laughs> Just use a little biblical example to say, get involved with somebody. <laughs> well, the today is uh, for Gordon and Anna. Are they here or did they leave? Oh, they're there. Okay. And where's my drink? There it is. But it's obviously for each individual. It's for the church. And I want to speak about following God's lead and taking new ground. I think it fits very well with what happened last night as well for those of you who are there and I know you're analyzing the future as a church. So the main idea is taking new ground, but of course we always want to be following God's lead. We don't want to be just ourselves uh, choosing where we're headed, but we want to be listening to his spirit, listening to his word, and listening to each other, which is what you were trying to do last night. And Gordon and Anna, you're following God's lead, and you want to be taking new ground. So let's, yeah, just, so that's basically what God desires. Sorry, you usually have to tell the person, click. And so I'm just going to go, and you follow me. OK. So God wants that for us individually and together. One of the things that struck me when we first moved into Quebec was every fall, right about Labor Day, we started getting all this mail inviting us to take a Spanish course, uh, take a cooking course, uh, take a gymnastics or a sports uh, evening, play badminton. I learned quickly that Quebecers during the summer know how to just kick back and do very little. They have the gift of relaxation. That's a good gift. Sometimes we Anglos are like us, everything about the watch and where I need to be next. During the summer, they just, and our church has slowed down, and, and I had, it took me a while to learn that. But Labor Day, all these things came in, and everyone's on this kind of like quest to learn something new, take some new ground. And I like that. I, that really, really struck me. And then they go through till about May, and man, once May comes, and you know, the bulbs are starry, the trees are starry, then it's kind of okay, time to lay back and go to the beach. And, and then they pick it up again in the fall. And there is a season. So today, I want to say to you, you're in the fall. It's probably time to take new ground. Now, what do we mean by the phrase, taking new ground? It's really quite simple. We're talking about growth. We're talking about maturity. We're talking about being transformed. And the great thing about this is everybody, this is an all play. Everybody can be involved in growth and maturity. The individual. There's couples here. We always need to grow. Nancy and I are at 33 and a half years. And we just signed on for at least one more year. We think we've got at least enough oomph <laughs> to go one more. <laughs> now, hopefully, at the end of that year, we'll sign on for another year. Obviously, you know I'm kidding. But we've had to grow and mature in that relationship. We can grow as an employee. We can grow as a couple, as a family. And you're talking about taking new ground as a church. So it's. It's an all play. Everybody can be involved. Now, one thing about growth, however it comes, 
is growth always means that we are to become more like Jesus Christ. That's what we're really about. It's the bottom line, not just we as individuals, but you as a church. The, the church is the body of Christ. And so taking new ground or growth in whatever area of our lives, it's always about becoming more and more like him, more like his character. Only one person in here looks like him physically, and that's Joseph. <laughs> so Joseph is, I'm just because I know Joseph, so I know I can tease him a little bit. But Joseph's trying to look like Jesus physically, and that's okay. Now, I noticed with Gordon that to be a missionary, you have to have a kind of a mustache and a goatee. See, that's the missionary link. <laughs> but we are called to become like him. Look at, look at Romans 8.29. Now, almost everybody knows Romans 8.28, right? For we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. So we say, oh, God's working for my good. But the key to the definition of that good is this next verse. This is 29. Because good, you might think good is an easy life, good is a comfortable life. But good is Romans 8, 29. For whom, for God knew his people in advance, and God chose them to become like his son, Jesus. So the good that God is working everything in our lives for good is in function or in relation to that truth that he's working Christ's character into my life. And that's not always easy. You know, we say sometimes so flip, oh, I just really want to be like Jesus. But do you really? Do I really? Because look at his training program. Look at what it cost. Look at the difficulties. Look at friends betraying him. Look at, look at, look at. Look at the religious authorities who were down on him. Even back up to his early life, his parents are fleeing. They're, so when we say we want to become like Jesus, let's realize it's quite a training program, folks. And yet it makes sense. He's training us to reign. He's training us to be part of his kingdom forever. He's, somebody once said to me, you know, you want to be a pumpkin or you want to be an oak? What do you mean? Well, it takes like six months to grow a pumpkin, but an oak takes like 100 years, dude. Good point. <laughs> Training takes time. And this is what he's trying to do with all of us, transform us. So let me just throw out a couple of potential areas of growth. This is all the intro, by the way. So, you know, sit back, enjoy the ride. We'll be out by one. <laughs> so you say, I, I want to grow. Well, here are a couple areas. I, develop physically. Uh, my son is now almost six feet tall. All the kids today are legs. They're all legs. Have you ever noticed that? What? Is that hormones? Or, seriously, what are we eating? They're all legs. Anyway, so my son says, I want to grow physically. So he's starting to work out at Nautilus Plus, and it's fun. Because before he was a skinny rail. Like, I could take him down, like, in no time. I could have just whipped him. He was, like, 145 pounds. Now he's, like, close to 180. And I'm telling you, it's starting to show. I'm thinking, whoa, if I don't take him down now, this week, I won't be able to do it next week. So you know what? I'm going to the gym with him. <laughs> Guess what? Gravity's taking over for me. So like, I'm like powerful here. It's all sinking, you know? <laughs> but we can develop, and it's great. It is great. But that's, that's one area. How about intellectually? Are we growing? Like I said in Quebec, it blows my mind. These people are like saying, I want to grow. I want to learn something new. Like, do we have any idea what's going on in the world? If somebody talks to you and they say, ISIS in Iraq, does that mean anything, right? I mean, we should know some things. We need to be knowing what is happening out there. We can be growing. Brain, you know, everybody's talking about exercise your brain. My wife is so into crossword puzzles and who's into Sudoku? Yeah, so your brains are growing. Now, it's a waste, well, it's not a waste of time, but. You know what? It can be useful and grow your brain if you learn a second language. People who know a second language, bonjour, mes amis, are growing. Their brain is growing. And there's some use to it. 
Okay, sorry, Rob. <laughs> it's useful because it's getting the church off your mind. How about growing emotionally? We can all grow emotionally. You know, it's been fun in the last years. They've started to come out. Remember when everything was, what's your IQ? And all they meant was intellectually. But now they're discovering probably more important than intellectual IQ is emotional IQ. Do we know ourselves? My son's great, you know, like at even 18. Like, what are you feeling? I don't know. <laughs> well, like, try to put a word on mom. <laughs> Who has sons that are grunters and yeah. <laughs> He's starting now. But we need to grow emotionally. And guys, often this is an area that the wife helps. Because she's often very in touch with what's going on. How about relationally? Wow, we're doing something that, and there are three there. I just got tired of bringing them up individually. Uh, you want to see if you're awake. Relationally, we can grow. I talked about our family. I've got a 26-year-old daughter, soon to be 27. She lives in Montreal. We're in the suburb of Montreal. Son's still at home. He's 23. And, uh, but we just started these family meetings. And what these family meetings are is we talk about the past 26 years in Quebec. And we try to figure out how have Nancy and I helped our children? How have we hurt them? How has our marriage through the hard seasons and the good seasons affected them? How have they affected each other? Anyway, we're doing this kind of like psychotherapy in the family. And we're trying to grow relationally. And it's very interesting. But it's all about relationships. We can develop spiritually, we can grow in skills and abilities. All these things are very, very, very obvious. And I'm hoping that something in your life this fall, you're going to say, I want to grow. I want to develop. How about areas of growth for a church? Still in the introduction, we're talking about this taking new ground, and here are some areas that are possible. We can grow in our love for God, our commitment to his will. We can grow in love and care for each other and for those outside the church. Again, we talked a lot about that last night. We can grow as leaders and disciples who influence others to follow Jesus. We can grow in numbers. We can have a greater impact in our community. There are always opportunities to grow. Now, the key question is this, but how? How are we going to grow and develop? How is that going to happen? How can we take new ground? And the reason we ask is if we're honest, all of us have tried and failed at certain areas of growth. I don't know how many people every January like go on a diet. And like, usually by the end of January, you know what? They're done with the diet. <laughs> that, it's, a, it's a sad fact, but we try many times to grow, but we fail. In that case, it's not growth, you want reduction. If you do the January thing, so that may be the problem. You, you know, we're thinking growth <laughs> instead of reduction. That's not the way to go. But there's hope because God's word does tell us about taking new ground. So let's look at an Old Testament passage, Joshua 1, 1 to 9, and it is literally about taking new ground. It's, it, it's a literal ground, but we're going to take those principles and build in uh, or, or touch our personal lives in the church life. So let's go to the verses, and we can read them together. So this is the book of Joshua. Joshua is Moses' assistant who takes over just after Moses dies, Moses has brought the people of Israel to the Jordan River to go into the Promised Land, okay? And so it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' helper, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, to all the Hittite country and to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of my law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, I know that these are very specific promises given to Joshua as the leader of the people. But I do believe that there are, in fact, principles that apply to us as individuals, to this church, to you guys going down to Honduras, and I want to bring them out for you. And trust that God will apply them in your lives as he sees fit. So, as I went through this passage, I see God making three promises that are linked to taking new ground. God makes the promises. And I see God asks us as his followers for two responses or actions that are necessary in the process of taking new ground. So let's look at it. Here's God's first promise. He commits to give us the new ground. You see, he can do that because the growth, the new ground is his. <laughs> and he can give it to whoever he wants to give it to. Right? Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The people and everything in it. Everything belongs to God. And so when he says, I want to give you something, he has the right and the ability to do it. And that is a fantastic reality. Because when he is calling us to new ground, when he's calling us to growth, and we know, remember the title, following God's lead into the new ground. Here it is literal ground. But usually in our lives, it is more spiritual or intellectual or emotional or relational ground that we want to take. We want to grow and move forward. So look what he says to Joshua. Cross the River Jordan into the land I'm about to give to the Israelites. These people will inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers, and I will give you every place where you set your foot. So... God has new ground for me this fall. I was, I, I think I was uh, telling Dave and, and Shelly on the way in. In, in, in this January, I'm going to be 60. And you say, 60? He doesn't look 60. Come on, say it. No. <laughs> Nobody's saying that. You're supposed to. <laughs> I said to my wife, I said, I'm looking so young, like those, you know, young 20 years. She says, who are you kidding? You know, wives are so good to bring us to back down to earth, you know. Look at your wrinkles. Look at the gray hair. You're right. I only look 45. <laughs> January 60. And so I'm saying, am I going to start coasting? Am I going to start slowing down? Now, I know we slowed down a little bit physically, but or am I going to stay at the forefront? Am I going to stay in this growth mode? Am I going to say... I've become enough like Jesus. If I ever said that in front of my wife, it would be over. <laughs> she wouldn't renew the contract. <laughs> You're going to stop growing? <laughs> no, 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 no. Or my children. So we've all got new ground this fall, this winter, and you really have new ground as a church, and you really have new ground, right? But God wants to give it to you. He wants to give it to you. It's his. Honduras is his. Spanish is his. Quiero verte, Señor, con mis ojos. Yeah, I want to see you, Lord, with my eyes. Here's God's second promise. Not only am I giving you new land, I'm going to give you my presence and my help. So I'm not just saying, there's a new land, I own it, just go get it yourselves. I will accompany you. I will accompany you. I will go with you. And it's, it's, it reminds me so much of, of, you know, the very last, like close to the last words of Jesus when he says, go into the world, make disciples of all nations. And then how does that finish? The very last verse of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 20 says, and lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. It's the same idea. I will be with you. The Holy Spirit is with us and in us. So God's saying, I'm giving you new ground, and he'll lead you to what your new ground is. He'll show you. And he's saying, I'm with you in this, in, in possessing it, in going after it. 
It's there. We just need to receive that from him. Now, what's the response he's asking us? He says, be strong and courageous. Look at, look at how many times. Three times. Anytime there's a three-timer in the Bible, it's important. You know, holy, holy, holy. This is the three. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. Now, part of me was thinking as I'm reading through this is, hold it. You're giving me the land, and you say you're going to accompany me. Like, why do I need to be strong and courageous? Like, you got, you got me covered. You got it covered. You're just, this is a cakewalk. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're in a fallen world. So even though God is saying, it's my land and I'm giving it to you, and he's saying, I'm accompanying you, you know what? Folks, there is effort in the Christian life. I, you know, I get the phrase, and maybe it's not as common as it used to be. Do you, you remember the phrase, let go and let God? And I totally agree. I, I think I get it. But let go and let God doesn't mean we become passive. We're always actively involved in our growth. It is rare. It, it, it does happen, and praise God for it, that he um, takes something out of our life miraculously. We pray, and it's gone. We, but the general pattern is that he says, I'm giving you a new future. I will accompany, but you are participating. Because it's only by the collaboration with him and the teamwork with him that we, in fact, are transformed into the image of Christ. Even Jesus Christ had to grow, right? Literally, physically. You know, there was a time, you know, he, he couldn't go to the outhouse. He, he was in some sort of diapers, and he grew through all these physical stages. But it also says in Hebrews, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Didn't mean he'd been disobedient, but he grew. He matured. Luke 2.52 says that. He grew in stature. He grew in social graces. He grew in, in favor with God and men. Growth is just part of the program down here. And you know what? It isn't easy. So we need courage and we need to be strong. There is a fight. And for these people, they had to go into the land. They had to take up arms and they had to fight. And some people died. Growing costs. We should never think, oh God, just give it to me on a platter. Look at our kids. Really good parents take such great care of that little baby because the baby's wholly dependent. But what if they kept caring for that baby as the baby got bigger and started crawling and what in the same way? Oh, let me change your diapers on the five-year-old. Oh, let me feed you to the 10-year-old. What? That's ridiculous. We want our kids, in fact, the goal is to move them from total dependence to, in fact, an interdependence, not total independence. We are dependent creatures. But interdependence, depending on God, and interdependence with people, and that's what we want to do. And they're telling our generation, the boomers, that maybe we hovered too much over our kids. And in some ways, communicated to them, by all that hovering, you're not really that competent, so let mommy and daddy help you. Whereas my dad, I remember my dad, <laughs> he was the old school. I said, I want to go, you know, I want to go down to the mall. Well, we didn't have malls in those days, but I want to go down to the whatever, the Dominion store. Do you remember Dominion, anybody? Okay. I want to go to Dominion. Good. Going to go with a few friends. Good. Could we get a ride? Like that was, I knew not to ask that question. My dad looked at me like, are you a Martian? You have legs. And he would say this, you have legs, you have a bike, there's a bus, a ride. Like get your act together. And because of that, like at 17, I traveled through Europe with a friend. Now that was a bad decision on my dad's part because I didn't have my whole head about me. But he wasn't worried about me being able to get along. I flew across the ocean alone because my dad had taught me, like, grow up and get with it. <laughs> you know, you cut lawns at 10. Did I do that with my kids? Of course not. My daughter might get violated or might, 
Yeah, but at the same time, so what we've done is we've communicated to them what? We should build in trust for God, and we should build in go after it, and we more. Anyway, that's probably enough on parenting. But be strong and courageous, and then obey God as fully as possible. Good. Obey God as fully as possible. Folks, nobody's perfect. We say that, and we're right. So let's not try to be perfect. What I, you know, the Christian life is not a tightrope. Some people live it like it is, and I've been in a Christian group or two that... We were just so uptight all the time, and we felt like we're on a tightrope, but I just have to be. That's not the Christian life. Jesus did not say, I am the tightrope. He said, I am the way. <laughs> a way has some space to move. A way allows some individuality. Now, we do have guardrails, right? We don't want legalism and doing our own thing. And, but we want to be moving. And, and look at these verses. He says, focus on my will. Get into my word. Listen. Meditate. I have a way to take you. And so God has, as we're in his word, he's going to be directing us to this new land. And we're going to be hearing from him. And again, I'm trusting that during this thing, at the end, you're going to say, oh yeah, that's where I need to grow this fall. How about God's third promise? If we believe that he's giving us new ground, if we uh, believe and embrace the reality that he's with us. If we are strong and courageous and stand up to the fight and, 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 and take on this challenge, and if we obey him, this is what he promises. Now, let me tell you, this is way different from, you know, health, wealth, prosperity type preaching. But it is God that says, I will prosper you, and he will. Look at this. How, look at the number of times he says it. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. But you've got to be careful to obey that you may be successful wherever you go. And you need to meditate, then you'll be prosperous and successful. And so what exactly that will look like is different for each person. What will that success look like? What will the prosperity look like? But it is a promise. But again, it's not the magic wand prosperity. It's not the I do nothing and God does everything prosperity. That's a false type of gospel. He grows us by training and development the same way we grow our own children. And as I said, in fact, we ruin them if we hand everything to them on a plate and don't let them get involved in the struggle, in the questioning. And that's what we're seeing. Like, I'm around a lot of young adults in their 20s. And it kind of reminds both Nancy and myself, that decade is a challenging decade. You know, you come out of teen years, you've been kind of wrestling with your identity. Then you go into the 20s, and you're kind of trying to figure out what type of work should I do, and you're usually moving away from home for a while, so you gotta learn how to cook and do your laundry and all this stuff, right? Or maybe you should learn it before. But it just interests me that process in life every decade has incredible challenges. And yet God is saying, I'm with you, I want to give you new ground. So the question is this: here's the application, and we finish with this. Some new level of growth, some new ground is before each one of us. I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit is talking to you. What's he talking to you about? He is speaking. And the question is this, or will we respond to God's call and his leading? As a church, he's going to be speaking to you through the next months about new ground. What would that look like? Nobody knows. Rob doesn't know. He's saying, Nobody knows, but God knows, and he will lead you through. The question is, will we respond as he begins to lead? And then will we step out with that presence and his power and take, you know, take the new ground and move to the next level? One thing that I can tell you, I don't know what you've discovered yet, but if you're really growing as a Christian, the Christian life is not boring. Now, I did hear a word or two last night and understand the context. 
But because we're always being called to new growth and new challenges, I actually believe we're living the most exciting life of anybody. And we're living not only for this life, we're living for the next. We, and you guys? <laughs> you guys like just got on. I don't know what the big ride is here in Halifax. Do they have a, uh, a park, an amusement park in Halifax? And anyway, we in Montreal, we have something called the Goliath, which means you're going to scream your head off because you feel you're going to die. And that's the sort of challenge the Christian life is. And you guys go to Honduras, it's going to be like the Goliath. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> but Gordon, enjoy the ride. My daughter gets in and enjoys the ride. I'm screaming because I think I'm going to die. But it, it, the, I, the Goliath takes off, and it ends, and everybody's safe. So I should stop screaming and enjoy the ride. Because God is with you. He's going to give you new ground. Just be patient, amigo. <laughs> Father, you do give us new ground and you accompany us. Help us to know you better as you walk us through your training program, becoming like Jesus. Thank you for life. You have true life. You say you came to give us abundant life. Lord, give us that courage. We want to be strong and courageous. We want to follow you, listen to your word and the, and the leading of your Holy Spirit. And I do pray for LifeBridge, not just for the individuals, but I pray for this unit, this family called LifeBridge. Guide them over the next weeks and months into the new ground that you want to give them. We don't see it yet, but you see it and you know what it is. Lord, walk them through. Bring them through the process. Give them courage and, and, uh, and strength to live it out. And we claim what you say. We, we believe it. We will succeed. There will be a new prosperity, new growth. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Gordon, the last word. <laughs> Took me five years to get it, too. <laughs> I think I will. You better sit down. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no, you can't. Not without a bullet. I was, uh, so there's at least one person here who will appreciate what I'm about to say. I was trolling Facebook this morning. Dave. <laughs> and I came across a, a, a statement that was put on there, and at least one person in the room will recognize it because I think they put it there. But it fit how I was feeling, what I was thinking. It says, tragedies will, will always be found in the things we love. If we're not willing to see the beauty in losing something that means the world to us, then imagine how terrible it will be to live for them. We must always welcome the end of things. For sometimes knowing that nothing lasts forever is the only way we can learn to fall in love with all the moments and all the people that are meant to take our breath away. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, his last words to a group of people, and these are mine to you, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you to give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. And live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you, I urge you, to warn those who are lazy, to encourage those who are timid, to take care, tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you 
who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. And now may the peace, the God of peace, make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. And dear brothers and sisters, pray for us, as we'll be praying for you. <laughs> and greet all the brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss. Or a holy high five, whichever comes first. <laughs> Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, you are good. Your mercies last forever. Your will is perfect. And I thank you today, Father, for this family, our family. I pray, Father, that you would bless this family. Continue to bless this family. Continue to lead and direct this family. Continue to inspire the leadership of this family. And I thank you so much for all the things that I've learned through the leadership who are part of this, this family here. And Lord, most of all, I pray that you would unite this family on purpose, your purpose, which is to seek and to save that which is lost. And I pray, Father, that as this family, our family, takes new ground, Father, that we would give you all the honor and the glory in our own lives and in our life as a community of believers. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. Father, give us courage to take every opportunity to share that blessing with the people in our lives, the people around us, and most of all, teach us how to love. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.